Hello and welcome to Scanner Day's Let's Talk AI podcast, where you can hear from AI researchers about what's actually going on with AI and what is just clickbait headlines. This is our latest Last Week in AI episode in which you can get a quick digest of last week's AI news, as well as a bit of discussion between two AI researchers as to what we think about these news. To start things off, we'll hand it off to Daniel Bashir to summarize what happened in AI last week, and we'll be back in just a few minutes to dive deeper into these stories and give our takes. Hello and welcome. This is Daniel Bashir here with Skynet Today's Week in AI. This week, we'll discuss face mask recognition, AI's effect on children, representation in AI ethics, and Google's autocomplete ban. The U.S. has struggled intensely with its coronavirus situation. States have slowly put mask mandates in place, but compliance varies depending on personal politics and financial situation. National Geographic reports that some companies, like Leeway Hertz, are pioneering mask recognition technology to get people to wear masks, as non-compliance can be harmful to public health. But for the same reason that people have trouble with facial recognition technology, some doubt whether mask recognition software should have a place in society. While it is well-intentioned, mask recognition software could be prone to issues like AI bias that plague facial recognition. Furthermore, collecting facial data without consent raises ethical questions surrounding data privacy. The major pitfall, to many, is the precedent that mask recognition could set for technology after the pandemic. As we cope with how technologies like AI and recommendation systems impact society, we should also be thinking about their effect on children. Today, many children are exposed to things like Amazon's Alexa, YouTube, and TikTok from a relatively young age. The use of AI in these systems has the potential to substantially impact their worldviews. In their younger years, children are still developing intellectually and emotionally. As AI comes to impact more parts of their lives, they are at risk for being hurt in a number of ways. The MIT Technology Review reports that a number of actors, including UNICEF and the Beijing Academy of Artificial Intelligence, have been paying attention and are releasing guidelines and principles for the use of AI involving children. The hope is that AI's effect on children is included as a consideration in the AI and policy development cycles, making AI explainable to children or to caregivers, and giving more care to the collection and use of children's data are both important goals. But ethics groups like UNICEF's still have a problem. Their expert advisory group has no representatives from regions with the highest concentration of children and young adults, such as the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. As the MIT Technology Review notes, efforts to establish guidelines for the ethical use of artificial intelligence will be useless if they do not account for the cultural and regional contexts in which AI operates. It is well known that AI systems cause problems that disproportionately affect marginalized groups. Failing to acknowledge and account for these disparate impacts risks making standards meaningless and ineffective at best, and harmful at worst. Fortunately, there are many experts and leaders from underrepresented regions to include in advisory groups. While some organizations are proactive about including diverse perspectives, many international organizations seem to be making little effort to solicit participation from these underrepresented groups. It's important for us to remember that making responsible AI the norm is vital, and that this is not possible without the voices of people who don't already hold power and influence. And finally, Google said Thursday it had reined in its search engine's autocomplete function to prevent it from favoring electoral candidates or political parties. But Wired quickly found bugs in that policy. Typing donate into the search bar prompted suggestions for donating to Joe Biden's presidential campaign, but not Donald Trump's. Google says its policy also bans statements making claims about voting methods, requirements, or legitimacy. But Wired found suggestions do include questions like how do I vote by mail? Google quickly moved to fix these apparent glitches, showing the tech industry's recent caution around politics. Since Donald Trump's election and revelations of political manipulation on Facebook, tech companies have become more humble and considerate that their technologies have impacts on society and politics. Navigating this has led to more reliance on human judgment. 
especially today, as measures important for things like public health have become increasingly politicized, it can take human judgment to sort out what is truly political from what is not. The years ahead will certainly see plenty of difficult decisions for the titans of Silicon Valley. That's all for this week's News Roundup. Stay tuned for a more in-depth discussion of recent events with Andre and Sharon. Thanks, Daniel, and welcome back, listeners. Now that you've had the summary of last week's news, feel free to stick around for a bit more of a laid-back discussion about these news by two AI researchers. I am Andre Kernkov, a third-year PhD student at the Stanford Vision and Learning Lab, and I focus mostly on uh, researching robotic manipulation and reinforcement learning. And with me is my co-host... I'm Sharon, a third-year PhD student in the machine learning group working with Andrew Ng. I do research on generative models, improving generalization of neural networks, and applying machine learning to tackling the climate crisis and medicine. All righty. And then I think we could just go in and dive in. We got some pretty interesting, pretty serious stories this week. Not as funny as last week, uh, sadly. And we can start with our first one here from National Geographic titled Face Mask Recognition Has Arrived for Better or Worse. It's pretty much just about how now there's multiple companies offering solutions for detecting whether or not people are wearing masks out in public. And this article is making a point that with many states uh, actually having mask mandates in public spaces, uh, these sorts of techniques can be used to measure compliance and basically see are people actually wearing masks or not. And it's uh, much easier to automate collecting such statistics than to have people looking at video and trying to count, you know, if people are wearing masks or not. So it seems pretty interesting to me and possibly harmless, uh, but uh, maybe there are concerns to be had. I'm not sure. Uh, What do you make of it, Sharon? I think this is inevitable, actually. And I'm actually surprised it didn't come out sooner. Uh, Of course, I think the reason why it didn't come out sooner was because of all the moratoria that were put on uh, for face recognition in general. But being able to detect um, people wearing face masks is is not not that surprising. Uh, and I've I've definitely seen out of the box detectors be able to detect some some of it, and that is without even fine tuning on that domain. So I think um, I think I'm not I'm not that surprised. Yeah, I think. There are, it's easy to sort of jump on any sort of surveillance uh, of the public with AI as uh, seeming maybe suspicious. But here, because the idea is not to recognize anyone, it's just to sort of see if people are wearing masks or not. Um, It seems like a fairly harmless uh, kind of thing. I I think we talked a few months ago, actually, about how out in uh, France, They were installing similar systems on public transport, mainly to gather statistics and see how effective, you know, messaging and communication is to encourage people to wear masks. And I see this as being very much similar to that and and actually quite useful. So as long as it avoids the usual pitfalls of, you know, only working for white people and uh, something like that, as long as we can actually see that it's not being used. Uh, seems like a good development and a good use of AI for helping with the COVID crisis. I think it's always a fine line between uh, being useful and being harmful. So definitely to definitely we should monitor this. But uh, I think as of now, this doesn't seem like it would be, this doesn't seem like it is uh, that, that bad if it is helping with the pandemic. Yeah, I think this article notes... Um, by itself, it's not bad. Maybe you can be a critic and say, you know, the precedent is set for monitoring the public. And uh, that was also the case when we talked about the uh, tracking and uh, governing of statistics in France. So as long as when this is instituted, there are sort of limits set and it's very specifically for COVID, uh, that seems like it is good, as you say. Speaking of positive use cases of AI, the next article from VentureBeat is titled Google Claims Its AI is Becoming Better at Recognizing Breaking News and Disinformation. So the title says it all, and it's Google recently launching an update to its BERT-based language understanding models to improve the matching between news stories and available fact checks. And I think this is really important 
I think this is really important, especially as November nears with the election, uh, but also just in general, uh, it is, this has been very, very important work that has been pushing forward. Uh, of course, um, nothing is uh, completely fake news proof, uh, but um, I think I think we're getting there. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think, as you said, this is uh, definitely a positive use case of AI. And uh, I think sometimes you focus more on the negatives because they generate more news and, uh, you know, there's less reason to discuss what works and what is doing good. But uh, this was pretty interesting, basically highlighting that um, the AI systems got faster and better over the few years. There was a blog post to Google kind of highlighting this progress. And it's showing that um, Google, in addition to being a huge researcher, is quite good at integrating that research and actually making use of it in its products and you know, deploying it in practice. So behind the scenes for things like detecting headlines or detecting disinformation, what um, you may take for granted is actually probably using pretty sophisticated state-of-the-art AI. Um, so yeah, it's it's good to see that uh, hopefully we're getting better and there have been some big stories of Google getting it wrong so presumably we can hope what they learn from it and now there's going to be less uh, disinformation being spread by them and some the of the details are also really interesting I find which is that uh, Google's autocomplete suggestions will take into account how reliable the content that it would be you know, suggesting to you would be. And so that's when you're typing into your Google Chrome bar or Google search bar, you know, a certain state, uh, a certain phrase, and then it tries to autocomplete that or give you suggestions. And so they would downweight those that are not reliable. Um, I, I think that is pretty cool. And I also think it's cool that beforehand it was largely protecting against hateful and inappropriate predictions, uh, which definitely makes sense. We want to reduce hate speech and obviously inappropriate stuff. Uh, but now it's expanded to this fake news, to this almost more election domain, um, and this more election specific, uh, this more election specific, uh, more election specific searches. Yeah, there's quite a few interesting little tidbits in this blog post I find, which is uh, fairly long. One other thing I find interesting is it uh, notes that besides just updating their software and their AI systems, they are working with Wikipedia on uh, improving their uh, editing to help uh, keep that information accurate because, of course, they take some of the info from Wikipedia to highlight in search results. They also donated uh, like six and a half million to help fact-checking organizations and nonprofits focus on misinformation about the pandemic. So it's interesting to see that, you know, obviously the AI systems are just taking information that's already out there and are relying to some extent still on human organizations to do the fact checking and to present the accurate information. So it's nice to see Google, at least in, in its PR and in some marketing and this blog post, highlighting both things and how they work hand in hand to keep information accurate. So kudos to Google, uh, at least uh, on this front, uh, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, generally kudos to Google so far. Um, I've been pretty happy with how they've been operating, uh, especially maybe it's relative to other tech companies, but um, uh, they've definitely uh, been, been trying at the very least. And on to our next piece, Kind of unrelated and not a topic we talk a lot uh, with respect to AI, which might make it interesting. The article is from the Technology Review again, and it is titled Why Kids Need Special Protection from AI's Influence. And it's kind of an interesting idea. It's about how kids often interact with AI systems. So Alexa or YouTube or a recommendation engine is AI powered. And so these AI recommendations and algorithms affect the kids uh, in uh, pretty subtle ways, but we might not think of you know, kids as a consumer or the ones being affected. 
And uh, the title says that kids need special protection from AI's influence because, you know, kids are developing. They are influenced by everything that's happening to them. They're still developing. So these AI recommendation engines and products need to be specially considerate and careful about what um, impact they have on these developing kids, how they shape them, etc. And apparently uh, that is the case to the extent that uh, there were sets of guidelines from UNICEF drafted to highlight uh, things that uh, AI systems and products should be concerned about with respect to kids. So some of these are that AI policies and systems should protect kids. They should uh, provide equitability for children's needs and rights. They should empower children to contribute to development and use of AI. Uh, and there's a whole sort of report on policies and things there. So my take, uh, I found it kind of surprising, honestly. I haven't thought about this topic much, although I have seen that you know, YouTube uh is somewhere where kids spend a lot of time and recommendation engine affects them in quite uh, weird ways. So yeah, interesting. Um, Sharon, what is your impression? I definitely think there should be guard posts uh, for children, especially uh, because uh, I think some of the decisions they make might not be um, as, as intentional or, or whatever. So I think, I think adults maybe can handle some of what AI does and over, op I think over optimization is actually the biggest uh, issue that folks have with AI because it will over optimize for uh, a, a certain objective. And then, and by over optimize, I mean, it would optimize for that objective, perhaps clicks and uh, at the detriment of other things that we care about in terms of as humans uh, and our well-being. And I think for, for children, this could be definitely of harm. I think um, it's really interesting with emotional AI assistance. I've definitely heard stories, some of the positive stories. I can definitely imagine some of the negative stories. Basically, if children are lonely, they might be able to you know, hang out with this AI uh, emotional avatar. Uh, but perhaps there are, I mean, there are certainly negative consequences to that as well. And it's a matter of what we think is is best as a society. And I think that's going to be very difficult because even among parents, people very much disagree about the philosophy of parenting and everything. So um, I, I think we'll see. I think there are some obvious guideposts in terms of what we should be doing, like the YouTube thing that you mentioned, but uh, specifics, I'm, I'm not sure how they're going to really execute on this. Yeah, I think uh, what you said uh, first with respect to what we optimize for is a good point. Um, this article also notes that the Beijing Academy of Artificial Intelligence also released a set of AI principles for children. And there they highlight a few things that you should keep in mind. You know, that includes safety protection, optimizing for physical and mental health, privacy protection, uh, education, and actually enabling expression of will for children. So some of these things we already care about with AI in general, like privacy or safety, but because children are in some sense, um, you know, more sensitive, you know, less developed, it does make sense to make it even bigger as a point. And um, yeah, it's nice to see what people are thinking about it, I suppose now, because we are entering the age where children are growing up with these AI systems for the first time. Certainly when we were kids, Sharon, I don't think we had much AI to interact with. Uh, at least in my household, there wasn't. So it's kind of a new era. Hardly had electricity. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we are in a new age and it's good to see some principles being drafted and some considerations for AI and, and kids uh, now. And on to our last article, why wasn't Uber charged in a fatal self-driving car crash from Wired? So obviously a spicy title, a very controversial a subject as for whether Uber should have been charged for uh, causing, a, causing a death with, um, causing a fatality with one of its self-driving cars by killing a woman in 2018. I think the issues with accountability and liability definitely still remain in AI as for 
you know, who is responsible? Is it the, uh, how much, or how much is everyone responsible? It's almost like you can't say who is responsible. You can't blame just one person. Um, like there are engineers that built this. There are people who made decisions, managers who made those decisions. Uh, there's the whole culture of a company. There is, uh, the person who might've been, uh, maybe not asleep at the wheel, but distracted at the wheel, but they're only human arguably. And then there's person maybe walking on the side of a street and, and they're not, not necessarily quote unquote supposed to be walking there, but they obviously still can. So, um, I think it's a very tricky, tricky problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, as you say, it's tricky and it's something we'll probably see more uh, with self-driving. Certainly, we'll need to answer this question of to what extent are engineers and people writing the software responsible if the driver is being negligent. Uh, and here, the story is that the safety driver who was behind the wheel and supposed to take over if the system was not working properly was charged with cr- criminal negligence. But Uber was not charged with anything and, in fact, was not prosecuted. Um, as you say, I think it's, it's tricky and we haven't certainly figured out how to answer these sorts of questions of uh, where to lay blame. I do think in this case um, of this particular crash, I'm a little disappointed Uber didn't uh, have more um, kind of uh, charges against it because there were a lot of things in the system itself that seemed very negligent. Um, Like for instance, um, there was uh, something engineered into the system where when the object detector actually saw there was something in front of a car, uh, the auto braking was actually set to be off and it uh, started to brake a second after kind of knowing that it should because of some hackery by the engineers to avoid false positives. Okay. And, uh, that is something that strikes me as very unsafe and something done to sort of cut corners. And that could have actually changed the outcome here. So yeah, it's complicated. And certainly I think, uh, we're going to see a lot more of these conversations to figure out how to lay blame at different parties, but, for this crash, given the Uber system was sort of hacked in some ways, it, I don't think it should have. I would have liked to see more of an attempt to charge Uber and at least maybe you know, prosecute or make clear that they could have done a better job. Yeah, I think setting this precedent could be very dangerous because now Uber probably thinks they can get away with even more. Uh, and that's obviously extremely bad uh given given the history of uber it this it doesn't bode well i'm sure um obviously travis kalanick isn't there anymore so maybe it's okay but i think the the precedent being set right now is a little bit around the thesis of yeah that that it's okay to have those types of broken systems uh, on the software and hardware side and that we don't need them necessarily to be perfect because they're not being held liable for it. Mm-hmm. I guess we'll see. We'll see if, if this is how it turns out. Presumably laws are being considered and yeah, lots of actual people who know legal systems are thinking about this. So hopefully uh, us AI developers will at some point uh, get around to knowing what is happening there and and what uh, the developments are. And with that, thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Skynet Today's Let's Talk AI podcast. You can find the articles we discussed here today and subscribe to our weekly newsletter with similar ones at skynettoday.com. Subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and don't forget to leave us a rating if you like the show. Be sure, Be sure to tune, to tune in, in next week. week.